Hello everyone and welcome to today's LinkedIn Live where we're going to be discussing the latest in social selling and AI. And it's really exciting to see so many people joining us on, to the, on today's show. We'd love to hear your thoughts. You know, it's a really interesting time. I don't think anyone can honestly put their hand on the heart and say that they, they have all the answers to AI. So I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. And hello to Bigona, if I'm saying your name correctly. Claudia, thanks for joining us. Janny from Finland. Bigona, Claudia, Bethany from Manchester. David from Canada. Dave Hughes from Sunny Sussex. I can't believe those two words are going together. Sunny Sussex, it is true. Matt from St. Albans. Fabian, Kiprian, if I'm saying it incorrectly. Prem, Dean, Emmanuel. Great to see you all and thanks for joining this session. And we'd, like I said, we'd love to hear your thoughts as we go through. If you agree with us, great. If you disagree with us, feel free to disagree as we go through the, go through the show today. So yeah, you know, here at Social Tree, we love all things LinkedIn. We love social selling. We love business development. And like every in industry, it is really apparent that AI is going to absolutely disrupt the landscape. And uh, thrilled to run today's session, joined by my um, business partner, friend, perhaps you could stretch it that that way, um, James Anderson. And James, I know you've been going deep on this topic, and um, recently joined the Barclays Accelerator program as well, where we've been yeah. kind of running our own experiments in AI <laughs> and social settings. So yeah. yeah, James, great to have you on today's show. Yeah, thanks Max. And as, as uh, Max alluded to, yeah, we're going to some really interesting uh, developments, agency side, but also technology side as well. And actually as part of this discussion, we're really gonna be um, really pleased to be introducing our special guest for the session, Christopher Winder, who is marketing director, open text, focused on developer programs. So he has a really great, uh, understanding of the real needs of the developer community but also has that marketing perspective to give us that bridge between marketing and technologies. He'll be joining us in about half an hour's time. He is also a power user of our platform Braindump. He's been using the platform for, for quite a few months now of his team so he can give us some interesting insights into how he's using the platform and also give his perspective on how this is evolving. So a really exciting session and uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing where this discussion goes. And as Max says, you can always just comment on the chat, ask questions because this is how lives are meant to be. It's meant to be a collaborative discussion forum rather than me and Max just talking at you through the camera. Yeah. So let's jump into it. So me and James, what we'll start off with is our general theory and thesis around AI and how we think it's going to impact social selling, how it already is impacting social selling. And we're going to Break, break down how we're kind of seeing the landscape. And again, in the comments, feel free to either agree with us, disagree with us. We'd love to know your thoughts. I'm sure a lot of you out there are already playing around with those tools in your own, in your own way. But James, I'll hand over to you. Do you want to break down our general thesis for the audience of how we are approaching AI and, and social selling? Well, it's a very ambitious question, Max, and, and thank you for that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we, we obviously as an agency have been have to be privy to all technologies that emerge, you know, whether it's artificial intelligence under, underneath that, the various different, you know, caveats around that. And it's interesting because when people talk about artificial intelligence, there's so many different technologies underneath that banner. So you have to kind of specify what does that actually mean. But in the context of what we've been doing at Social Tree for the last 18 months, is we've been really looking at how this technology will serve us better to automate and give our clients a better service than we have done pre the Cambrian explosion, which was last year. So we've been kind of on this trajectory for a long period of time. And I think what the, the, the biggest thing I've learned from, from this journey is that from building we go on the journey of developing Brain Dump. For those of you that don't know what Brain Dump is, it's, it's our technology platform, which we are building to essentially help us develop and scale our efforts to social trees. So, you know, this journey has been really interesting. As Matt said, we are now part of the Barclays Venture Growth Program. So we're going through a 16 week accelerator to develop the idea. But I think what the big learning I've taken away is, is removing that barrier between ideation and asset creation. And I think that goes beyond just artificial, you know, just marketing. I, I think we're in a, in a world where now where the creatives are finally in a place where you can actually demonstrate and articulate and actually turn your ideas to life very easily because of the technology. You know, a couple of years ago, it would have been so hard for people who didn't have the skills in graphic design or copywriting or videography to turn the ideas they had 
into reality but now that's changing so it's a really exciting sometimes scary world where essentially there's going to be a democratization of of of, of, of creation i think everyone's going to be able to create stuff and you're going to have this create world where each one of us is going to have the power of a 50 person agency and um i think that's just a completely world-changing belief when it comes yeah. to marketing so yeah i don't know what what your thoughts on that are yeah i mean yeah. We've been quite heavy believers in AI and automation even before ChatGPT, you know, on LinkedIn and, you know, AI is already prevalent, automation is already prevalent everywhere. Mm -hmm. But I think ChatGPT, the release of that and the large language model behind it, it for content creators, for creatives, anyone producing content, it is like the Uber moment for taxi drivers. I, I think it has completely disrupted the way organizations do marketing and already we're seeing really incredible results. I mean, the power of, of things like ChatGPT, you can input one or two kind of thoughts or questions in there and you can create 10 blogs, 100 social media posts. Like, of course, they're not quality, you know, they're not like amazing quality right now. But, um, but now it's at everyone's disposal to, to write blogs. I mean, literally last year, Q4 of last year, people were paying us to write write blogs for people to write content mm. pieces and chat gpt can automate a lot of that we kind of and i believe and i don't know if you agree james that actually we are moving it, the role of a copywriter or role of a content creator is actually moving away from actually physically writing content to actually becoming a data scientist i think the role of in two three four five years if you have someone in your team whose job is copy i think their main job will actually be, be building unique data sets so going out there doing research getting insights and building a unique data set that's different to the competition but then using the ai to create blogs to create content off the back of it there's actually no need to write to sit down and write a blog anymore more like those days were over it's like the calculator when it first came out like people there's no need for, for like manual mathematics you need the data to input you need that human input to make it work and to check the answers and to work through the problem but i think that's what the large language model has done and for anyone out there working in social selling it is now incredibly easy to produce content but it's also incredibly easy to produce really bad content and i've been on linkedin and seeing a lot of people who it's very obvious they're using chat gpt you can see with the emojis in the in the content and you can read it. it's very machine like it's very robotic but it's going to get exponentially better and um, i actually also believe that long term we are going to move into a future where the workforce will just be bots and sales are going to get really impacted by automation and ai you can envision a world where linkedin is literally just sales bots talking to bots for example if i'm a marketing director of a company and i want to procure some seo services i could just talk to my bot on linkedin and go and procure talk to other bots about their services the bots can do a lot of the negotiations until finally i get served the get served the content and i think that's the future that we're going to we are moving towards and the and it's incredibly exciting but also terrifying because it's going to disrupt so many people and um yeah well, yeah I, I imagine i i don't disagree to some extent with the idea that i think we'll need copywriters i don't think they're going to be extinct i just think you're going to need less copywriters per per company so i think rather than having 10 people to do the job you'd have one person who'd be overseeing an operation which would have traditionally done by 10 people so i don't think we're going to you know, when it comes to marketing, I don't envision a world where marketing is going to become completely automated by machines. I think that it's just going to be less people doing the jobs which we used to do because yeah. we have augmented by technologies, you know, su such as you know, such as intelligent chatbots. And so, so I, I think if you are a copywriter and you are wondering, you know, what's my future? I think that you absolutely, you know, you do have a skill, and I think actually the skill now is in how well you can create prompts you know how how brilliant are your prompts how do you communicate with this technology and if you can use your your skill as a copywriter to actually engineer prompts better then you're going to be far ahead of someone who's not even using ai so i think that you know the skill of copywriting is changing just like the skill of being a videographer i think you're still going to need people to be videographers or filming or do graphic design but you're going to you're going to have to operate in a world where you're going to be doing a lot more than what you usually did and you can achieve that through using technologies yeah. well there's some questions that have come through so maria has put out the question but can ai create personal and differentiated copy what do you think james what well, from your experiments can it create personal and differentiated copy well i certainly think they're getting there so give you an example so that with, with um with brain dump at the moment uh, what we're what experimenting is 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 
how do you, for example, someone's LinkedIn profile and someone's uh, experience, you can actually now uh, view and get a lot of information from your profile and from your content history. So you can actually now use that data. So just say you said you had a campaign with say 600 people, you could, you could go on that person's profile, you could look at that person's content history. You could also look at the company. You can look at what the company have been posting on their blogs and the website. And then all that data is then pushed to a, your own proprietary um, in a language model, whether you're using uh, Google Bard, you could be using ChatGPT. And don't forget, these are all open source, particularly Facebook Llama, Llama Facebook Llama. You can actually have your own open sourced model you can train on proprietary data sets. So you can actually train a model to actually understand the behavior of your prospects online. And you could, you could teach a model to say, well, here's the inputs of the data, create me a messaging cadence based on all this information which you've got. So yes, I think that that's coming. I think we're still a long way from that. I, don't, I think at the moment the technology is very primitive, but I think absolutely in the future, you're going to be able to create very personalized campaigns using this technology. And I think there was a, we had a discussion with Facebook a few years ago and they were talking about personalization at scale and how the future is going to be each person is going to have a very personalized experience across their digital marketing lifetimes. And I think that this is this AI technology is just going to speed it up. So yeah, that's kind of my thoughts. I don't know what your, your opinions are on that, yeah. Max, whether you agree or disagree? Yeah, I think it, well, if you look at my own LinkedIn newsfeed, we use um, what the tool we've built, Braindump, where you just input your ideas and then it will spin out content. And obviously you need to edit it, but look through my newsfeed. Does it seem personal to you? Does it seem different? Like, could you tell that it's, a lot of it's done through AI? I kind of treat AI like a sandwich, you know, like I put in my ideas, <laughs> okay, the analogy, I don't know where I'm going to go with it, but in the middle is the AI, the ham, perhaps. The sausage, the you're the making sausage. a sausage. A sausage. So you're putting the meat, which is the data, yeah. you're putting it through a machine, which is you, and it comes out as a Exactly, post, that's a good analogy. And you're using the machine, yeah. it's augmenting your sausage making. Yes, that's so good. I, <laughs> that, I think you're, yeah, you're that's on good, the way. Maybe. I was on the way to that yeah. analogy. I could have done <laughs> some AI help, perhaps. But uh, down here, whoop, whoop, no need to fight AI. Embrace it now or someone using it will take your job. And... Yeah, I definitely echo that, that um, someone using AI will, but I've actually seen some people quite reluctant to use AI, especially yeah, people yeah. in some teams who I think they feel threatened. And I felt threatened by it. Honestly, when it came out in January, February, I was scared. Like I've been charging like thousand pounds a day to produce content. And I've just seen this tool that can now do it at a fraction of the time and increasing rate. Like it is scary, it is unsettling. But what we've had to do is obviously embrace it and use it. But I have seen some other people actually shy away from it and think and basically take the argument where well, it can never replace a human it can never take the human touch and and do an ostrich because they feel feel threatened but a lot of people have gone the other way and have fully embraced it but i would just encourage not to not to do a, 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 an ostrich there and samantha andrews i think there will be far more appreciation for well-crafted original copy from copywriters that will become a refreshing change from ai copy would you be able to tell it is ai copy is my question to that. What do you think about that question, James? Will you yeah. be able to tell the difference? So, well, that's, that's the, 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 the issue. Well, not the issue, but I think what people are not really realizing is that the exponential development of all of this technology. So today, the copywriting is quite poor, but in three months time, it's only gonna get better. And that's, that's why I think people are, you know, not really understanding how exponential growth works. You know, you get to a point where you have a hockey stick moment where you have this, or can be an explosion of intelligence. And I think that's coming. And, you know, I, I really would be hard pressed. I would, I think most people, if you do a, if you use a, 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 you know, AI poorly, you can tell. But if you know how to write prompts and are, are equipped at doing this, then you can create copy, which is really, really good. And you can train your own AI in whatever technology you're using to write content in the style of your voice. And it, it really is indistinguishable from, from anything yeah. else. So I would honestly, yeah, it, it, I know it may feel hard to accept, but actually for most people, it will be almost impossible to tell. Yeah, well, and it's no, not only copy, it's video as well. Yeah. It's video and, and, and photos, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. Well, there's a question here from Megana. Hope I said that name right. What is your thought on the overwhelming of content on social media to AI? And 
I think in terms of that one, if you look at things like Google search, Google is already really good at filtering out rubbish content. Like if you type into Google social media, you're going to come up with like a billion results for social media. And you could sit there and write a million bad posts on social media. It would never rank for number one. The algorithms can catch quality. And although you can create loads of content really for free, you still need to be producing great quality content. But I would argue that AI can create better quality content. I mean, look at LinkedIn, like they've got all the data on what content performs well. Like if LinkedIn really wanted to, they would be able to create content that can get reactions, that can get traction because they have the data and they know you instinctively. And it's just the case of someone putting this, pulling the switch to do that. And um, I just don't think people would actually be able to tell whether AI is eventually written by a person or not. It'll get so good exponentially good like this is only like obviously ChatGPT has been around for a while it is version three that really took the people's imagination but but i think that the game is now unique data sets that's what i believe i think it's about can you capture unique data sets and when people realize that actually all this ai is built on my data i think companies will protect their data way more because you know if you're going to lose your job to an ai who's just been trained on your data then you should be compensated by that and obviously there's lots of regulation that that may come into you, well, come I, into place. I mean, I mean, again, with the SEO example, <clears throat> there's a whole systems to, to sort of get your website to the front. But I think in terms of the content volume, there is going to be a deluge of volume of content. Um, I would say that ultimately, I, I think, you know, the long learned in, in all complete honesty, I think the long long term future of LinkedIn is actually com uh, um, uh, bots. Yeah, and I, I, I believe that in a decade's time, you're not going to actually log on to LinkedIn that much because you're going to have an agent on LinkedIn, whether it's human or artificial intelligence, most likely artificial intelligence, which should be managing your profile and creating content, interacting with other people's bots. And then when you have a specific, specific ask, you know, I want to find out some interesting content about thought leadership, your bot on LinkedIn will be the one that manages to steal that information. So I actually think people are looking at this argument wrong. I think actually in the future, social media, and it's already getting that way, if I'm being completely honest yeah, with you, with it's content. being overrun by content and bots. So I don't think we're going back. I don't think, you know, the, 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 the horse has bolted from the stable. I just, couldn't, I just can't see how we're gonna go back to a world where your primary interface on social is an intelligent, Bot, yeah. which is again, I'm not saying that's great or terrifying. I'm just, yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's a good segue into a <laughs> video that we want to play about sure. Microsoft's Copilot to give you a view of uh, what companies are trying to build. And you might have already seen Copilot. I'm yeah. sure a lot of you have, but I'd l we'd like to play the video just to remind everyone and just to share the vision of what Microsoft are working to. Who own LinkedIn, by the way? So yes. Microsoft are you know, when it comes to social selling and B2B, LinkedIn is the place and Microsoft own this, they are the mothership. So if we could play the, play the.
Yeah, so there you go, Microsoft Copilot. You can see that their pitch is very much, it's gonna increase productivity. You're gonna be able to produce so much more work. And actually there is a big economic um, problem that we're in where productivity has decreased. And obviously we've declining human, human birth rates in order to increase GDP, we must increase productivity. And perhaps this is the way that uh, people can, can do it. Obviously a lot of speculation whether Microsoft will deliver on this. They did have that, um, see a lot of memes around that clip. They used to have the, uh, you know, they've tried this before and it, and it hasn't quite worked out, but in the work times of social selling, will Copilot come over to LinkedIn? And it already is, look at, your, look at LinkedIn, they're already providing like AI prompts. Mm. Um, they're, they're providing places where you can create content. LinkedIn are very schizophrenic. On the one hand, they say, we don't believe in automation. On the other hand, it's heavily automated. And, and really the name of the game is automation and AI in sales. Like anyone who tells you otherwise, I think, um, probably just isn't using the tools to the best of their ability. And you actually can do personalization at scale. Like you don't have to do cut and paste messages anymore. You can automate loads of messages, loads of emails, very personalized. Still needs a human to go through it, but now we can reach reach personalization at scale. And just to go back into some of the questions here. So Sandeep, AI can act as a collaborator, but cannot replace a human. Well, I think it can replace a human because I mean, look at like eventually, look at your supermarkets in like Morrison's or Sainsbury's, they're all self-serve checkouts. Look at McDonald's. You can fully see a world where a lot of these shops have like very few people like McDonald's, for example, you go to the drive through, it's an AI assistant who takes the order. A lot of the burgers are flipped by machines. It's got three or four people in there. The, the head count reduces a lot, but the argument on the flip side is that with AI, everyone can create businesses. You know, if you've got an idea, you can just ask the AI to create a website. You can ask it to create a marketing plan, a business plan, financial projections. So now so many human ideas will be unlocked. So there'll be more businesses, but just less people in those businesses is, is one idea. Unless you disagree, like, of course, no one can know the future. Maybe AI will never replace humans. If you disagree, I'd love to know in the chat and why you disagree. You know, happy to be swayed. If, what? If you disagree, but I'd uh, love to see your argument. Yeah. And, and what do you think? Do you, or maybe you disagree. I no, don't no, know. I don't disagree. I, I think that the, there's a convergence of, of technology. So I think like this is going to converge with blockchain. I think that one of, the, one of the best applications of blockchain is actually verification of human identity. So you might have a channel which is majority bot content in the future, but you'll also have the ability to have, and it's coming now, like there's actually law being passed now which is gonna ensure that content is watermarked when it's human created or when it's AI created. So you'll be able to tell through legislation, I think, what is real and what is human. You're just not gonna be able to tell on the basis of quality, essentially. Yeah. yeah. Um, another comment here that prompt engineering is going to be a mandatory, mandatory skill. It'll be really interesting to see how the education what? system adopts um, the, the, AI and also, just a quick quick on the prompt engineering. Like, I mean, there's platforms, there's technologies now which can prompt engineer for you. And an early example, of this is a, a is a software called AutoGBT, which is basically a really cool. It's open source. You can download it on GitHub. You can run it on your own own PC. And AutoGPT is a self prompting version of ChatGPT. So you can actually just ask it, say, hey, do this. It will create a series of prompts, like a whole library of prompts, and it will go ahead and do it for you. And it's, it's not, it's very cumbersome. It's not perfect. So actually, in many ways, I think prompt engineering is going to be first on the block for, um, uh, for, for automation, because, because you're going to have a, 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 you're going to have layers of prompt engineering where you're going to be able to actually teach an AI application to, to do the prompts for you. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of, it's exponential. Sandeep reckons real human customer center experience will be a priority. I would ask you to go and speak to some Gen Zs and see if they like talking to people on the phone. From my experience, WhatsApp, they, they're happy to do chats. I think people are changing, you know. I think especially with COVID, you know, something has happened with the younger generation where they're not so social. I think, you know, if you're a baby boomer, even a millennial, you know, you are going to probably like customer service, but this younger generation, I don't think they really care. They just want, they want it quick. They want it there and then. Do mm -hmm. they really care about human experience? And if they can get the cost savings, you know, f through going an automated contact center, will people pay extra for human, human experience? I don't think so, but if you, you know, happy to be swayed. And also another uh, Slav Issa, <laughs> I've probably masked that name. Sorry, Slavish, though, if that's uh, not how you pronounce it. But ChatGPT has information up to 2021. It's not up to date. Not now, it isn't. But 
when well, eventually it will be. Well, no, that's it is updated <laughs> because you have plugins now. So the the, the original uh, model was trained on data up to twenty twenty one, but now there's ChatGPT plugins, which essentially means ChatGPT is now online. So when you think about ChatGPT <laughs> and you think about this stuff, you have to imagine it's just a it's a really smart model, and it, it, it it's learned how to essentially manipulate words and language to help humans. So with plugins, when you go on ChatGPT4, for example, you can use plugins, which means that ChatGPT is plugged in via something called an API in most instances. And API is basically, a, for layman's terms, is a way different softwares can communicate with each other. And you can actually use ChatGPT on data up to today. So you can use a tool saying, hey, find me content around the Rugby World Cup, which starts tonight. ChatGPT will communicate with a verified partner on OpenAI, and you can do it on ChatGPT. You can just type in like sports app and ChatGPT will actually give you an up-to-date result from today. So actually, yes, you right now, artificial intelligence is using information as of today, rather than 2021. Not yeah. for the free version, you don't get that, but if you're paying $20 a month, you can use plugins. Yeah, and down here, companies can build private LLMs which can interact with large public LLMs to provide yeah. their audience a tailored to them specifically with their when they're on TOV, process content, this is where the magic will happen. And yeah, you know, companies can build their own LLMs and um, Companies can build their own bots, and we actually have seen an, an interesting case of a um, of a, a friend and a partner of ours who's building a a really cool offering where they're actually taking influencers and, and turning them into bots. So taking all of their data, uploading it, creating bots where you can have personalised experiences with influencers. And I think brands can do that as well. For example, you know whether you're like KPMG or your big or a law firm, you could just upload your knowledge into a central database, have an LLM, and just rent out your bot. Like you may not actually need to think about professional services firms. Their money comes from renting out people, like human beings, professional service people. But you could probably have a more knowledgeable bot, and when it's applied knowledge when it's intelligent and can apply the knowledge to your business mm. we can you could definitely see a market in the future where companies are just renting out bots and you might in your company have a bot for accounting a bot for hr a bot for this you have your work alongside bots and sales bots will also be the future can be the future if you work in sales maybe you should start thinking about building your own sales bots and then you've got your own workforce working for you 24 7 for for free um, and is a theory. Yeah, and go back to the uh, the open source. And what's happened is Facebook have built their own open source model called Llama, and loads of people now. And you can do it too. You can go on GitHub and you can download Llama. You can literally, uh, literally, like tomorrow, if you know how to deploy your own version. There's loads of these open source language models being released. And you can then have that in a privatized instance for your own data. So you can get all the benefit. And actually, ChatGPT, OpenAI have released an enterprise version of uh, ChatGPT using Microsoft Azure because they're partnering. So if you're an enterprise, the data question is also secure as well. So yeah. that's, that's another thing which is really exciting. Well, I think, um, I think it's time for a guest, James. What do you think? Uh, well, in a minute, yeah, I think Chris's um, camera is still, we're still getting some technical stuff of the camera, oh, so okay. when, when right. Chris's camera turns yeah. on, we'll, we'll switch them on. I know Chris is actually here now, so yeah, we'll, uh, we'll bring in Chris. Hello, Chris, let's put our headphones on, uh, so anyone wants to hear Chris. So whilst we're getting set up again, Chris is, uh, yeah, a very intelligent man, a PhD doctorate, uh, and a uh, doctorate in, Mar I, I, I believe, what was your thesis on, Chris, uh, before I, I, I don't want to plagiarize and ruin your research, but what was it on? It was on uh, the, the genetics of brain development. Something that wow. I don't do anymore. Much <laughs> topic than what I did. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. Not human brains anyway. No. <laughs> Well, it's lovely to have you, Chris. And as I said uh, in the intro, we wanted to bring you in because you are, you know, someone with a really, I think, really uh, brilliant set of complementary skills, which I think can lend a lot of value to this discussion. You obviously are involved in marketing, but you ha you work with developers, you work with technologists all the time, and your research and your obviously academic history is is really accomplished as well. So, yeah, it'd be good to just get, I suppose, what your perspective is on all this stuff, high level, like artificial intelligence and marketing. What's your stall and what's your initial opinions on all this stuff? Yeah, I, I, I think it's a, 
I think there's a lot of potential there. I think one of the things that we see is that for marketing, right, you're, you're often trying to talk to one to many. And AI does a great job of that. It does a great job of summarizing something and turning it a little more generic. It's great at that today. So the so it, you can see the value as a marketer today because you can create that. You can take all those personas that you love to talk to and say, you know what? What's the content that gets me the most bang for the buck with that? That's an, that's an amazing use case. It's a time saver. You know, going back to the earlier point, it's a productivity fix in, at some level. But what it doesn't do yet that I'm really excited about how it's going to do and, and, you know, having been using brain dump for a while i love where you're heading with that is you know how do we take how do we take each one of these different ideas that we have get it to the right place faster so i think the future is really bright i think there's a lot of really good potential but it will be it will be interesting to see how this all all plays out yeah and i i think um to your point around and again for those who don't know we keep saying the word brain dump so uh, chris has and his team has been using our platform because what our platform's initial stall is saying as max said earlier on is is the future is all going to be about combining and kind of getting this the best juice out of our collaborative team ideas and then using technologies like artificial intelligence to augment those ideas and make things happen so almost like human is going to be the ultimate idea factory the ivory tower residents making this really interesting stuff so yeah could you expand slightly on because i know with your role you're constantly having to I mean, open techs are a massive company, you know, a global company, different time zones, different languages. So how do you see that evolving? Like what's kind of the, uh, the thoughts around that? Yeah, I, I think it, it gets interesting there when we're talking about how it will evolve to, to be a productivity tool, frankly, for a company as large as open techs, where we have 36 offices in, in 20 countries. Um, we're 20,000 people. Uh, we work globally, so I work with people in India and in Germany, and often at the same time. So I think where the I think where the AI is really you know going to be really valuable is allowing people to work in their language and work in their time zone, but still be part of the team. I think one of the things that we struggle with, and most companies struggle with, is this idea of if we're this big. Do we need to do we need to have silos so that you're only working within one time zone away? And that's not really an effective way to work. That doesn't take advantage of your global knowledge, and that doesn't give you productivity gains that you're looking for. Yeah, absolutely, um, and I agree. Yeah, yeah, and um, I've got a question, Chris, about how you see the role of marketing teams in the future. Like, do you see the the functions of marketing shift in the future. I mean, for example, with the rise of social media, you've had new job roles like social media marketing manager. 20 years ago, that job role didn't even exist. The idea of social media having a full time. And I remember starting out my career, people were like, get back to work while you're on social media. Now they're employing whole teams. And actually now social yeah. media managers are becoming like CMOs. They're like rising up the ranks. So yeah, interesting to see like, what do you see the, 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 uh, shape of a marketing team in the future do you see new roles being made do you see old roles disappearing what are your thoughts on on that yeah i think i think there's there's two ways to think of that that, that are important one is the the business to consumer so the b2c route i think there is going to be an enormous shift and you're going to see a lot of marketing roles that are replaceable frankly um generating that content generating is going to be is still going to be important but some of that because you are trying to figure out that one-to-many piece of it can be done by AI. So the role of the, mar the marketer in a B2C format is going to be more of the, of the, of the orchestrator. You know, where are we going to send this? What is the right decision for the company that needs to be made rather than outsourcing that? B2B is a little differently. I think, I think what we're seeing there where AI is kind of not coming into the mix is it's really not replacing people. What it's doing is allowing you to take advantage of the people that you have and kind of extend their productivity. So you're really not seeing those kind of productivity losses um, that, that you're seeing in other places. 
Well, that's interesting, yeah. And I think there's a lot more moat around B2B in terms of the expertise, technical barriers to entry and the longer sales cycles. So you're saying that essentially, if you're if you're talking low transactions, high volume, essentially what you're saying with like B2C, like I'm looking yeah. to buy some toothpaste, you, and you're, that, that's an imminent automation risk. But actually when you're, what you're saying is if you're dealing with much more slower, nuanced technical sales cycles, actually you've still got time. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, Skynet is not coming for you just yet. You have some time, which is which is good to hear. I, do you have any? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'd like to jump back into the the <laughs> audience here. Um, so, Lloyd, humans are required to do the heavy lifting. Machines cannot drive delivery trucks and do the grunt work. Tell that to Elon Musk, who is building self driverless trucks. Of course, a while away. Right now, yes, of course, humans can't do the grunt. Uh, robots can't do the grunt work. Um. um any thoughts on that one, Chris? Yeah, I think I think like similar to what we see with the marketing, the other parts is there's always going to be a place for the person in the middle. Um, whether their what their role is is going to be really interesting. It won't be what it is today, but I don't think I don't think we're going to engineer ourselves out of work. I think we're going to have to figure out how we retrain. This is the same problem we've had pretty much once a generation, right? There's a new technology that changes the way you work. And and we need to shift faster. You know, a hundred years ago, when the steam engine was the the new to, new toy, you had time. It it was going to take 10, 15, 20 years to become standard. Now you don't. You have maybe five years before AI really comes legitimately a tool that has to be used. So you have some time, but that is not the kind of time scales that old fogies like me work on. <laughs> I need five. I need five years just to wrap my head around something. Sometime. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, we've got a comment here, Sadi Kumar. How will AI affect the current market job, marketing jobs, and your thoughts on this? I think we've already talked about, upon that actually through the last conversation. Uh, Henrik here saying, I think colo I, th I think content will follow a bit the same journey as you see with AI image manipulated photos. Have seen examples where people end up with no fingers change small eyes to be round ones. Have you played around with AI imagery at all, Chris? Or what are your thoughts on uh, the state of content with AI at the moment? Is it, where do you think it is right now? Yeah, I, I, I think the image, images are really hard, right? Because an image only really exists in your brain and articulating that in words is really difficult. So until we get better at engineering the oh this is what the human meant the images are always going to have a little bit of funkiness unless you start with it and then you have the plagiarism problem we have the same problem in the written word um it's not as bad but you do sometimes if you try and create net new that isn't related to what you started off with or isn't related to what's out there in the world you do get what are called the hallucinations or these other things that just you just look at it and go I, that's not that's not close to what I meant. I'm not sure where you got that from. And the system also doesn't know where it got it from either, right? So there's still some work to do before it before it's the perfect engine. But I I find that's a good thing because it gives you the opportunity as a human to to still use your brain and still be part of the the tactical and the strategic part of of it. I just wanted to have, because I, I know we're wrapping up soon, but I wanted to just, uh, get your commentary, Chris, on, I think, because, you know, you are someone that's yeah, been been playing around with our MVP, MVP for a while now, and you're still very much an MVP, but I'm just kind of here to see, like, you know, what interests you about the platform and where do you see that going? And it'd be great, um, I don't know if we can pull up the website link on the chat so people can use it themselves. But um, yeah, keen to get your thoughts because I know you've been experimenting a bit and I've really appreciated giving your time and effort to use it and you're a very busy man. So yeah, I'm wondering why you've spared precious time of your day to use it. <laughs> so there, there's really three use cases where, where, it's, it, where Brain Dump has really kind of worked for me personally and for my, my team. So I have, I have pretty severe uh, dis dysgrammica, which causes my, my, my written word to be nothing like my spoken word. Um, doesn't matter how many times I write it, it's just never going to be there. Um, 
I consider myself very articulate. I can speak well. Um, I can speak on my feet. I don't have to have prompts and everything else. I don't use scripts. But that doesn't translate into the written word. And for marketing, a lot of what we do is written word. So I've been using Brain Dump pretty religiously from the beginning to translate things for blogs. So I use it to to make sure, and then I, you know, the prompts that you've created in there, I can use it and it does the grammar for me. It does the other things for me. It rethinks the format. So I can take that central thought of, you know, of how, do, how does a mid-market developer think? I, I go through and I talk it through and then that turns into now I've got my five different pieces of of content and it's formatted correctly. It's something that I then can I already have ready to go in various formats. So that's been a phenomenal use case for me. Um, one that we're exploring more in the that interview interviewer mode has really been is really something that we we kind of played with. We play with it for kind of brainstorming sessions. So with each one of my team members, they have a different role and how we go to market. So I use that with them so that we're, we're collecting the ideas so that you can really focus on the conversation. The, the other use case that we're starting to play with, and 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 I think there's there's something there, but we haven't had the opportunity to play with it enough, is one of the one of the things that we do is we produce a podcast, which is called Maker to Market. And it's really about how do you bring a product to market? And we've been using it to go through and because we go across different markets, everything from toy makers to enterprise software makers, we use it to take all those episodes and then say, okay, what's the common thematic that goes through that? And, and the way you guys have built Brain Dump, it's doing a great job of that. And so we've got, we're, that's one of the things we've been playing with lately. And that's gonna be the use case that really brings it, brings a lot of value to us, to my team, rather than just me personally. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, it's great to hear. And uh, Ted here. Hey, everyone. This is a great. Uh, this is so great. So thanks, Ted. Some good feedback there. That's um, better than the um, a lot of the hate mail we usually get. So thanks, Ted. That's really great. Um, uh, Jim, with AI increasingly used for generating content for websites, emails, and social media, how do we stop bad actors generating unfeasible amounts of disinformation and Someone who, for myself anyway, for someone who's a Web3 enthusiast, I believe that blockchain is the only way to identify content. And I think actually we all need a digital passport for the internet. I think that we need to grow up and be digital citizens. Like we have a passport for our community. People know who you are. I can't just go into the street and pretend to be a police officer and start arresting people and, and get away with it. And on, online, it's like there is no, there's no, um, there's, there's no policing, but if you do it through a decentralized manner where everyone is on the internet, they have a vote and everyone can vote for the way of the internet and it's decentralized. So no nation controls the internet, but you do have a digital passport. You have a DAO, decentralized autonomous organization. I think the future is, has to be a blockchain. It has to be decentralized. You can't have a government control the internet, but I believe in, I would like to see a digital passport. But Chris, I don't know what your thoughts are on how you, address um, uh, disinformation online? Yeah, I, I think I think it's an interesting problem, right? I think you the whole value of the internet when it was started was the sharing of ideas, particularly the social media side of it, was sharing of ideas and, our, and being able to have a real conversation even with people that aren't in your close sphere. Now, I think you're always going to have bad actors. I think there are ways that we're starting to see people build you know the you know use it use the weapon to be the to, to to solve the problem you're starting to see ai that can identify disinformation you're starting to see that i think that's a good place to start i do i do like the idea of of how blockchain and web3 technologies can can kind of make this something where you can you can isolate and extract when when you get bad bad information it's not the disinformation that's a problem it's the it's the the amazing rate at which social media can expand it and and just have it go everywhere i think that's a real problem not so much there's always going to be people with kooky ideas and they're always going to sound like they're really great ideas so you're never going to stop that i mean look at look at some of the cave drawings not every but not everybody has <laughs> yeah. that thing yeah <laughs> well it's yeah. always been out there it's just a matter of now we need to figure out how we stop it from being everywhere. Like, there's only so many people that were coming into that cave. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, 
Great analogy there. And um, unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, we are about at time and um, we are going to run these sessions regularly. So make sure to follow the Social Tree Global page. And um, yeah, massive thanks to Chris for joining today. Some great insights there. feels like we didn't Thank have enough you, time. No, really. we need to do this again, Chris. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so it'd be great to join us. And at Social Tree, <clears throat> our mission is all about helping sales professionals do better online. Marketing teams harness the power of this technology. And if you feel like you could be doing a better job on LinkedIn, when it comes to social selling, when it comes to events, community building, we're here to help. And ladies and gentlemen, there is one thing that AI cannot replace, and that is human connections, songs and singing. And I would like to oh. leave this oh, no. show on a end note with our very own James, the serenade. Well, this is, this, this is a little treat, it's a Friday treat for a all Friday of you. Friday treat for you this all. Is a, this is a wonderful rendition, but actually a wonderful rendition is about the future of social selling. So here we go. Social selling is the best thing I've ever seen today But I'm scared of how AI is gonna take my job away Away, 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 away Say